Dr. Scipione will talk more about that. Welcome, Simonetta. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Oksana Sukowarski. Thank you for joining us, Oksana. Oksana is also from the University of Alberta, where she's a professor of medicine, medical genetics, pediatrics, and psychiatry at the Topin Research, Topin Research and, and a Topin Research Chair in Neurology. Dr. Sukowarski's research focuses on the management of movement disorders, diagnosis of neurological genetic disorders, and genetic testing of adult onset hereditary disorders. I hope I got it all, Oksana. Thanks. Oksana also has been recognized many, many times for her amazing work and has been named one of the best doctors in Canada. Congratulations, and to both of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to our participants, thank you very much for submitting questions prior to this symposium. We're, I'm using those questions to ask both um, Simonetta and Oksana throughout this broadcast. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Scipione, and then I will move to Dr. Sukowarski. So we'll start, and however, you can see it's a fairly casual format, so uh, if either any of us want to jump in and ask more questions, we will. So, Dr. Scipione, are we ready? Yes, hi. So I, I, I referred to your research earlier. I, I'd just like to know, and I think people calling would like to know, how did you reverse the HD symptoms in a mouse? Well, we saw reversal of motor symptoms uh, in the YAC-128 model of Huntington disease. Um, what uh, um, my lab had found prior to this research is that uh, a lipid called GM1, um, and which is highly enriched in the brain, um, is expressed at the lower levels than normal in the brain of um, HD mouse models, as well as uh, in uh, uh, skin cells from uh, HD patients. Um, and uh, uh, my lab also showed that uh, uh, after restoring normal levels of this uh, uh, molecule, GM1, HD cells become more resistant to um, uh, stress stimuli and survive better. So uh, following uh, these initial studies, uh, we started uh, testing uh, whether uh, uh, GM1 would have a similar beneficial effects uh, um, in, in vivo, in an animal model of Huntington. So what we did uh, was uh, to administer the GM1 directly into the brain of a YAC-128 mice. And in order to do that, we um, implanted a small reservoir filled with a GM1, as well as a small pump, um, under the skin of this YAC-128 mice. And the pump was connected through a small tube and a small hole in the skull directly to the brain. And so the pump could infuse continuously the drug into the brain for four weeks. So we had two groups of mice, um, some HD mice that were receiving GM1, the drug, and others that received just a saline as a control. What we observed was that after two or three weeks of treatment, um, the mice that received the GM1 um, performed just as well as uh, wild type normal litter mates in uh, the behavioral motor test that we perform in the lab to assess motor performance in this transgenic model of Huntington disease. While mice uh, that had received the saline were still showing uh, um, robust uh, deficit, motor deficit. Thank you. How, how long have you been working with GM1 research? Well, uh, um, we started working uh, on this project uh, uh, about uh, four years ago when we first uh, uh, found out, when we first uh, discovered that the levels of GM1 are decreased uh, um, in uh, HD models and in HD cells. And after that, uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, that uh, administration of GM1 in vitro protects HD cells uh, from uh, stress. And uh, in a couple of years, uh, uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, that uh, GM1 has beneficial effects uh, on motor symptoms in the YAC 128 uh, uh, mice. And where will you take it from here? 
Well, right now we are working on a number of related projects. Um, well, first of all, uh, we are determining whether GM1 has a similar beneficial effects also in other models of Huntington disease, and this is very important. Um, we are also um, assessing whether GM1 is a disease-modifying treatment, whether it can delay uh, the progression of Huntington disease. And um, in this regard, what we are doing is to determine whether GM1 can decrease neurodegeneration in animal models of the disease, of course, and whether it can ameliorate non-motor symptoms of the disease, um, including psychiatric-like symptoms, anxiety-like symptoms, depression-like symptoms in animal models. We have also we are also um, uh, we have also begun uh, experimentation to determine whether uh, GM1 maintains. Uh, its uh, therapeutic effects, uh, even uh, when it is uh, uh, administered uh, uh, by intravenous uh, or uh, subcutaneous injections in mice. Um, uh, it's still controversial, uh, still not clear whether uh, uh, GM1 that is administered uh, intravenously or uh, subcutaneously could reach the brain uh, uh, in therapeutic concentration. Um, but if it does, uh, as you can imagine, uh, this uh, would uh, accelerate uh, the translation of our discovery um, to a therapy for a Huntington. Other projects that we are working on um, involve uh, uh, determining uh, uh, the exact mechanism of action of GM1. Um, how does it uh, protect uh, HD cells uh, from uh, death? Uh, why does it improve uh, symptoms uh, in the uh, mouse models of the disease? And uh, um, this type of knowledge uh, may help uh, developing uh, other drugs, uh, potentially with uh, better uh, uh, pharmacokinetic uh, profiles, and so easier way to be administered in patients. You, you spoke to, in, in that answer, you talked about two ways that the drug can be administered. Can, can you um, explain that better, the two different ways? Yes. So um, uh, in our studies uh, so far, uh, we have, as I uh, described before, uh, we have uh, infused the drug uh, directly into the brain of mice. And we have done this because uh, um, uh, there is evidence uh, in the scientific literature that uh, when GM1 uh, is uh, injected into the blood, of animals or even a patients, and uh, or when it is injected subcutaneously, uh, the peripheral GM1 is not able uh, to get uh, to the brain uh, in uh, uh, significant uh, amounts. Now, um, this, uh, this is all the studies are relatively controversial, and uh, so it's important to determine in Huntington models whether therapeutic benefits could be associated by peripheral administration, so either injecting the drug um, directly into the veins of these animals. Is that why it takes so long? Is that why it takes so long to take it from where you've discovered this in a mouse model to a human model, partially because it's controversial at this point? Um, well, there are a number of reasons why it takes long. Um, it actually takes uh, several years for every um, basic scientific discovery to be translated into a human therapy. Actually, uh, there are statistics that uh, indicate that the average time for translation of a basic discovery is somewhere between 10 to 16 years, depending on the statistics that you that have been consulted. And uh, um, this is in part is due in general to the need to replicate studies in different models as well as in different labs to make sure that every form of bias is eliminated. The need to finding reliable biomarkers of the effectiveness of the drug in human studies, uh, the need for toxicological studies that would is relatively safe to use, uh, the need for large clinical trials, uh, well-controlled clinical trials. And of course, in the case of GM1, uh, definitely, the fact that we think the drug would have to be administered directly into the brain to be effective is uh, represent a further delay and complication. This is obviously a very invasive method of administration.
So if somebody is, is further along with HD and there's nothing else available for them, in Canada, why can't we just try this on somebody if they're willing to participate? Well, um, unfortunately, Bava, uh, testing uh, any uh, new drug uh, um, into any patient uh, um, has to occur uh, um, uh, through um, a very uh, well regulated uh, and a strict process uh, um, approved by Health Canada or uh, in the States it would be approved by the FDA. Uh, now these agencies uh, scrutinize uh, um, both uh, the intended uses of the drug uh, as well as uh, um, uh, the nature of the drug, uh, the way it is uh, manufactured. Uh, they scrutinize also uh, the science uh, behind uh, um, the use of that drug to make sure that it's uh, sound uh, enough to justify risks uh, associated to administration of the drug uh, in humans and also they scrutinize the clinical trials uh, the design of clinical trials so at the end this is extremely important and absolutely necessary to make sure that uh, as I mentioned before uh, the science behind the uh, um, administration Administration of new drugs is sound uh, and justifies the risks, uh, and to make sure overall uh, that uh, uh, there are no foreseeable uh, side effects and toxicity associated with the use of the drug in humans, uh, and uh, overall uh, to make sure that uh, the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the patients are protected as much as possible the well-being of patients is well protected. So it would be illegal, basically, to administer the, an experimental drug, even to volunteering patients um, that are at an advanced stage of the disease. Now, um, I'm very aware that uh, these might be difficult to understand uh, for somebody uh, at an advanced stage of the disease and do things uh, that he or she uh, has nothing to lose. But in the end, uh, this is done in the best interest of the patients. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's well explained. Many people don't understand that, so thank you. And actually, you mentioned clinical trials which is a wonderful segue into talking to Dr. Sikorsky about clinical trials. And, and we, we just heard a great explanation from Dr. Scipioni about her research. What's involved and what process is involved in taking that research to clinical trials? Uh, well, thank you very much, Bev. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. And um, I've been doing uh, re uh, research with clinical trials for about 25 years now. And it's um, uh, initially we had a lot of research going on in Parkinson's disease, uh, in, but very little in Huntington's. And because of research, like Dr. Cipione's and others, uh, we have the opportunity to, to do quite a lot of clinical trial research now in patients or individuals with HD. Um, so this is, as Simonette explained, this is quite an involved process. And first of all, the first thing we need to determine when a new compound such as this uh, is available to us to study is whether uh, it is safe in individuals, in the individuals with the condition, and also whether they can tolerate it. So for example, there are some compounds or some drugs that are already on the market that uh, in theory uh, had a good effect in mouse models with HD, but when we gave them to individuals with HD, it actually caused worsening of their gait, of their balance, of their cognitive function. So. Uh, so initially when we tried uh, a compound or a medication and even a small amount of, of individuals, we saw that, they would, that it was not safe and they could not tolerate it without making the condition or some of the symptoms worse. So that's the first stage that we need to go through is to determine safety and tolerability of any compound. After that, uh, we need to find the right dose to use. So if the dose is too small, then obviously it's not going to work, but it doesn't mean that the medication isn't effective, it's just that we're not using the right dose. Or if it's too high, then it could be causing side effects. And there was a study uh, that I was involved in a couple of years ago um, in Parkinson's disease, actually, where we had a very good 
what looked like a very good drug for people with Parkinson's. And when we gave it to them, almost everybody got side effects, and so the study was stopped. Mm -hmm. What we found out later was that the dose was too high. But you can imagine the effect that had on individuals who didn't want to try this drug anymore, yeah. that spent a lot of money on trying to develop this compound that now, um, so sort of the, the amount of time and money that was wasted on something that was probably useful, but in fact the dose was too high and we got side effects. So that's the second step, is to do a dose finding study where we determine what the best dose is of a drug or a compound that, that would produce benefit without causing side effects. And after that, we would go to a larger, uh, what we call a placebo-controlled trial. So a trial, so the first two studies are usually done with smaller number of individuals, and then we would go to a larger uh, study, uh, which is placebo-controlled, uh, to see whether that medication or compound is effective. Um, so people always ask why we use placebo-controlled uh, method, and it's very important because anybody who enrolls in a study feels better. And it's been shown that about 30% of people just by being in a study will do much better than before. So if we didn't have a placebo control, then it will look like the medication may be effective, but actually it's just this placebo effect. So we always have to have at least one study where we com compare the drug we're interested in versus a placebo. And those studies, uh, like I said, usually are done on a larger number of individuals for maybe a longer period of time to make sure, again, that the drug is safe, that it works, it does what we think it should do. Um, but the length of this study could vary. So, for example, if we want to look at a medication to see whether it will help depression or it will help chorea, then we may only need to study to do the study for a couple of months because we'll know right pretty quickly whether it works or not. On the other hand, if we're looking to see whether the drug has a neuroprotective effect and that whether it could slow down progression of the condition, then in a condition like HD, which is very slowly progressive, we would need to do the study uh, on many patients over a large, uh, over several years at least to determine whether there is a benefit or not. Um, all of these studies, of course, need to be approved by Health Canada, as was already said, as well as the ethics committees at the university. So every university has a ethics committee to make sure that we as researchers um, have developed a study that is ethical and uh, that there's no coercion, for example, that there's nothing harmful that can happen to the individual. And right now, how many studies are going on for HD, and, and what studies can we expect in the future? Uh, so the studies that are going on in Canada right now, uh, first of all, uh, there's one called PREDICT, which is uh, run out of the U.S., uh, which is to look at individuals uh, with um, who have not developed symptoms of HD yet and to look at them over a number of years uh, to see, uh, for example, what the first symptoms may be, what the uh, psychological changes may be, changes on imaging, on MRI, for example. So that's an observational study where the individual would come in every year or so and have a number of tests done uh, to determine on um, uh, so just to collect information uh, both uh, medically and psychologically how they're doing over time. Um, there's an interventional study called Two Care, uh, which is a neuroprotective study where we're looking at coenzyme Q10 versus placebo to see whether uh, coenzyme Q10 uh, given at a higher dose than you normally would get at the drugstore from your naturopathic uh, caregiver, 
whether it will slow down progression of the, of the condition, whether it will slow down progression of HD. So that study is ongoing. It's been ongoing for several, several years. We know that uh, so far there are no safety issues, so nobody's getting side effects from it, but we don't know the results yet. We'll know in the next couple of years whether the people on coenzyme Q10 uh, are doing better than those that are on placebo. And this is a double-blinded study, so neither I know, nor the research coordinator know, nor the patient knows whether they're on placebo or coenzyme Q10. Uh, if we did know that, would potentially bias the results. So we're all blinded to that, um, uh, uh, to what they're taking. Uh, there's two studies that we are currently recruiting for across Canada. Uh, the first is called CREST-E, and that is, again, a neuroprotective study uh, where we're studying very high-dose creatine against placebo. So again, this is a blinded study, so none of us know which uh, which arm of the study the individual is randomized to, placebo or uh, creatine. The dose of the crea uh, creatine is the compound that bodybuilders use to plump up their muscles, mm -hmm. but there is some evidence uh, that it may help the cells in the brain function better, and so we're hoping that it may slow down progression of HD. Um, uh, so we are looking for individuals that have early symptoms of HD, and it is a, uh, up to a three-year study uh, where you'll be taking this compound. Um, and so there are a number of centers across Canada uh, that are participating in this. The second study, and that's, uh, sorry, that study is done through the Huntington Study Group, uh, which is an international uh, uh, research uh, collabor uh, sort of collaboration uh, throughout uh, actually North America, uh, Australia, Europe to try and find better treatments for individuals with HD. Uh, the second uh, study is called Enroll HD, which is being funded by another group called the CHDI, um, which is the Cure Huntington's Disease Initiative. Uh, where it is an observational study. So for Enroll HD, anyone with HD, at risk for HD, with a family, for a member with HD, uh, can volunteer to participate. And in this study, uh, we're, we're collecting information on uh, family history. Uh, we're collecting uh, DNA samples, which are being uh, sent to Central Biobank. Um, cl clinical information, and what this study is, it's really not a, not a study in itself. What we're trying to do is to create a large worldwide database of individuals and families a with HD that will then be available for researchers to study, and so that we get good information on, uh, on all sorts of aspects related to HD. Um, so those are, now there are a couple of studies that will be coming in the future, uh, funded uh, or organized through the Huntington Study Group, uh, looking at better treatments of Korea, for example. Um, so there are a few other studies that uh, we're looking at or are being developed right now. Thank you very much. What are the benefits? So people listening today are, are listening to these studies that you're describing. What are the benefits? of individuals participating in clinical research? So, well, the most obvious benefit is that you may have access to a medication that may help you that you wouldn't otherwise. So, for example, if you participate in the study, uh, for example, with a crest -E, so say if creatine is shown, a uh, high-dose creatine is shown to be helpful in slowing down disease progression, then the individuals participating in the study would be, would have would have been on this medication for several years before the results are released, before everybody else knows. Um, in drug studies uh, that are organized by the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of times if you participate in a placebo-controlled trial, uh, then they will let you continue, and that medication is shown to be helpful, then the pharmaceutical company will uh, provide you the medication for free before it actually comes on the market. So that's another advantage. So if you participate in a trial um, and it works, 
then you'll have access to that medication sometimes for several years before Health Canada will approve it. So that's the most obvious benefit. Um, the other benefits are uh, that you just get really good care generally when you're in a trial. You get uh, all sorts of lab tests, EKGs, uh, all sorts of monitoring for all sorts of things, both clinical and, and laboratory monitoring. Um, and for example, recently we had an individual in a trial uh, where she developed some problems and called us and we investigated it right away and found out that she uh, was developing cancer, but because she was part of the trial and we were able to get the testing organized so quickly, um, she had a surgical cure. Whereas uh, at other times, you know, by the time you see your family physician, by the time you get referred, um, it will take much longer. So there are benefits where you can get, uh, sometimes we can find things before they would be found out otherwise and get them treated for you because you're, you're part of the study and we have to do that as part of the safety. Uh, so it's not sort of cue jumping, it's just that because when you're participating in the research trial, we have to monitor the sa uh, all the safety factors so closely that we can sometimes pick this up. Uh, the other thing is that you build up a great relationship with uh, the study coordinator, the nurse, uh, the physician involved in the study. So it is a special relationship uh, between us and the study participant because we see each other so, um, so frequently that it is a, a special and a very uh, good relationship a lot of times. Um, the third reason is just that you're helping people um, for the future, so maybe some of these trials that we're doing might not help the individual, but it might help their children, might help us find a cure for their children. Now there are um, a couple of disadvantages that I'd like to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, that it does take a lot of time and commitment on, on the individual's part to do the study. So you, there are many more visits to see us than there would be if you were a regular patient in the clinic. Uh, you have to take your medications on time. There's sometimes a lot of forms to fill out with documenting how you're feeling, uh, et cetera. And it is very important to, uh, when you're do participating in a trial, to really commit to it because the trial, it, we're only going to get good data uh, or good results if the individuals really commit, take their medications on time, take the medications they're supposed to take, uh, fill in all the forms. So it is a commitment, a time commitment on the study participants' time that is very important. Um, the only other thing I'd like to mention is that all of us at the university centers do trials. Um, it is important for everyone to know that you do not have to participate in research to, part to get care, ongoing care, at any of the Huntington centers. And that if you feel uncomfortable, it is your right to withdraw from the trial without jeopardizing your clinical care. And that's very important to realize as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for making that point. Is there a cost involved? If people want to participate in clinical trials, is there a cost involved to them? Uh, well, one of the um, advantages is that there is no cost to the medication and in fact, as I mentioned before, you might be getting a medication that's not available to anyone else free of charge, uh, so that's an advantage. Uh, generally, we will, uh, the, as part of the trial, we will reimburse individuals for parking, sometimes for costs of transportation, so if they have to drive from Red Deer to Edmonton, we would reimburse them for their costs of the gas. Uh, so we try to, to make sure that there is no financial burden on the individual. Now we can't pay individuals to participate in clinical trials in Canada because that is felt to be coercive. Uh, so there is, we can't pay you to participate, but we can certainly make sure that you don't incur any travel costs. So people shouldn't be out of pocket any, uh, any dollars for participating in a clinical trial? Generally, yes. That's great. Uh, how do clinical trial participants stay informed as to the results of the study? If they're participating, they, they'd like to know what's going on and they, they'd like to keep updated on, on the results. How, how do you keep them updated? 
so all of the trials usually have a safety monitoring committee. So there is a so while we're blinded to uh, what the study participant is taking, uh, there is a committee that can look at all the data to make sure that there are no side effects. So uh, that we get letters regularly from the safety monitoring committee to tell us that it is still safe for the individual to continue to participate, which we would tell them at every visit. Um, but while the trial is blinded, of course, we can't get any results. Uh, of what uh, if one group is doing better. But if one group is clearly doing better than another, then again the safety monitoring committee would stop the trial early to tell us that because if we know there's a positive result, we may not need to keep going and just tell everybody the good news. Um, and on the other hand, if there is clearly no benefit, then they may stop the trial a bit early. So there are um, safety um, sort of monitors in place that will let us know as we're going on that there's nothing bad happening, no reason to stop the trial, uh, et cetera. Uh, once the trial is finished, uh, I know the Huntington study group as well as uh, the pharmaceutical companies will release the information to us to tell participants whether they were on placebo or on the compound or medication that we're studying. So we do share that with the participants as soon as we can. And then uh, once the results are analyzed, of course, there, we do, there are presentations of the data at a variety of conferences. The data will be published in scientific journals. So we try to um, make those publications available to anyone who is interested in them. Uh, also, groups like the Huntington Study Group will have teleconferences for all the participants where all the participants uh, actually get to hear the news firsthand about this trial and get to um, uh, ask any questions. And I think that's very important because if you've spent two or three years of your life participating in a trial, uh, you should know the results and you should um, uh, you should be able to participate in um, a discussion about what that trial meant, etc. So I think the Huntington Study Group is very, uh, very conscious of that and really does try to make sure that everyone knows what happens uh, with the trial that they participated in. I think it's the nature of the... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say now, if you're interested in knowing what trials are going on, uh, that you may want to participate in, uh, then I think Huntington Society Canada has that information. Uh, the Huntington Study Group website would have that information. CHDI, the Huntington Societies in the U.S. And all research trials, clinical trials now, have to be registered in the U.S. with the National Institutes of Health. So if you go to NIH.gov, uh, then you can find out a list of all the trials that are going on right now. That's very helpful. And that takes that's a good segue into the next question. Who can participate in clinical trials? Do, do people have to have the genetic mutation? Can their families participate? Who can? Uh, well, that depends on the trial. So, for mm -hmm. example, in Enroll HD, anyone who wants to participate, who is a member of the HD community, pretty well can participate, uh, and to be part of that trial, you do not need to know what your HD results are. Uh, in CREST E, uh, the creatine trial that I was speaking about earlier, you have to have early symptoms of HD to uh, um, to be able to participate in the trial. So in that situation, you obviously would know not only your HD results, but your, uh, that, you are, that you have early symptoms. So each trial is different, and the inclusion criteria of who can participate are specific to each trial. Uh, but generally, we are very careful that if you do not want to know whether you have early symptoms, uh, whether what your gene test is, we're very careful to keep uh, that confidential, and I don't think anyone should be in a position where they find out what their HD results are without wanting to. 
So that, that answers my next question about if you want to participate in a study, yet you do not want to know your status on, on HD, you don't have to know. You can still participate without knowing. Uh, well, no, that depends on the trial because in CREST E, you need the inclusion criteria are that you are showing early symptoms of HD. Uh, so by definition, you would need to know that you are showing early symptoms of HD. But in enroll HD or, or predict, you do not have to know. So it, it, it really depends what sort of, whether it's an observational trial or whether it, we're doing an intervention. Because if we're doing an intervention, the inclusion criteria are uh, quite specific for who can participate. So if you don't want to know whether you are showing early symptoms or what your HD test shows, there may be some trials that you would not be able to participate in. So we would, but we would explain that ahead of time and do that counseling ahead of time so that people are not put in a position where they get information that they don't want to know or aren't ready to know yet. I, I think the other thing is that um, um, we're very careful not to release HD gene test results unless you want to know, and we, those are only released to the individual uh, specifically and not, you know, sort of sent around, you know, to other physicians or other individuals. So we're very careful with that information. And so privacy is, incre is incredibly important to you and you respect that? Well, privacy is very important and also it's also very important whether you've been participating in a trial. So, uh, so we, uh, we're very careful about privacy in all aspects of clinical research. Uh, and for example, the, when the research is done, or maybe I could use the example of enroll, when we send the information on enroll, we don't send patients' names. Uh, the information on all study patients is, uh, is protected so that their names are not part of the data. So for example, if, if we send the, um, uh, the information on a participant in, in a study, they're sent in under a number or a code so that whoever is looking at the data in the study doesn't know who's who at all. And the, um, the uh, sort of link between the code of the patient and the name is kept completely separately in a locked cabinet that only I and the study coordinator would have access to. So even when somebody comes to look at the data, you know, sometimes people come in to make sure that we're doing the right thing and to, to verify the data, then they don't see the patient names, they just see the data in a coded form. So privacy is extremely, extremely important when we're doing research studies that we don't uh, release any personal information on any individual participating in the study. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from Facebook, and I think you've already touched on this one, but perhaps we can make it a bit more clear. How do you choose people for clinical trials? Uh, so, We uh, would try to advertise through the Huntington Society or through our clinic, through our, uh, clinic that we are looking for volunteers to participate in a trial. So, so then if somebody is interested, they would approach us uh, through uh, contact information that we would give out, and then we would meet with that person, explain what the trial is about, and if they are interested in participating, then go through the what's known as inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, so, uh, for example, if I can come back to CREST E, if the individual is interested in participating uh, but has advanced Huntington's, then they would not fit the inclusion criteria, so we would not be able to enroll them in the study. Uh, so the first part is entirely voluntary on the individual's part whether they would want to contact us to participate in the trial or not. And once we know they're interested, 
then we would go through the criteria to see whether they fit the criteria. In any interventional trial, the criteria are fairly rigid because we're looking for a specific type of individual who has certain symptoms so mm. that we can study those symptoms. So it would depend on the trial? It very much depends on the trial. We've heard a lot in our community about gene silencing and trials for, gene, for drugs or therapies that result in gene silencing. Can you explain, either one of you, could you explain that term a little bit more for the community to understand better? Sure. Um, so um, gene silencing means uh, to stop uh, the production uh, of the gene, of the, of the protein uh, that causes Huntington disease in this case. Um, it, this can be done with different methodologies. Uh, there are uh, currently uh, two different uh, techniques uh, that have been used uh, to silence uh, mutant huntintin or huntintin in uh, animal models. And uh, um, these are, uh, there are now preclinical, encouraging preclinical data suggesting uh, that uh, both approaches uh, could represent a potential therapy for Huntington disease. These are still at the preclinical stage, but uh, the data are very encouraging. Um, so the way it works uh, is that uh, um, uh, each of us, uh, now this might be a little bit uh, complicated, so Bev, help me out uh, if I become uh, too technical. Um, so um, the pro uh, a protein is uh, produced based on a template that is called uh, messenger RNA. And this template um, is uh, in turn copied from uh, um, our genome, from our gene, the HD gene. Um, the silencing techniques involve the use of molecules that can recognize the messenger RNA that uh, will lead to the production of Huntington and block its uh, um, translation, literally, um, uh, its, uh, the, the production of the, um, of the corresponding protein. Um, I don't know whether this was uh, clear <laughs> enough or... Well, maybe... let, let me paraphrase. Simonette, I'll, I'll just paraphrase. So it, it is, we can turn off the production, gene silencing, focuses on turning off the production of Huntington protein and then enabling it to turn back on again when the body needs it or the brain needs it. Is that fair? Um, yes. Uh, in order to uh, turn the gene on again, basically one in this case would have just to discontinue the, the treatment and uh, over uh, the time uh, the production of the protein would start again. Thank you. Uh, we know one more question for you. We know that uh, research, there's some research that we've read that Huntington, before we become symptomatic, before individuals become symptomatic, there may be already be changes happening. Are scientists looking at studying individuals at risk from a very young age to determine when is the when do the symptoms actually start before they're very visible? Are there any studies going on like that? Um, so there is one study called Trend HD, which is being run out of the United Kingdom. And um, I believe Vancouver, the center in Vancouver, is participating in that study uh, where they are looking at individuals that have no symptoms whatsoever and would not be expected to have symptoms for many years, if not several decades. And looking at the changes on MRI scans, on PET scans, on uh, various other testing, cognitive testing, for example, to see what the earliest changes that they can pick up are um, in order to treat uh, sort of to prevent the condition from coming on. So this is happening not only in HD, but in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's and all the conditions that come on later on in life. And I think we all appreciate that the changes in the cells or in the brain start decades before 
the onset of symptoms that we can see. But that is very important to be able to recognize those changes and what those earliest changes are because if we really are looking for a way to stop this condition from developing, that's what we need to know. So I think that this is extremely important research uh, that is being done by that group, by Tabrizi and colleagues. And I think by that research, we're really going to understand when we should be intervening, for example, with GM1, whether we should be giving it at uh, a much earlier time period before uh, the symptoms start. But I think that's happening in all the conditions that present later on in life. Thank you. Is there, we're, we're, uh, this hour is going very, very quickly. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, uh, um, I would just like uh, to thank the Huntington Society of Canada for inviting us uh, to be there with you in this occasion, uh, and, uh, um, and for the amazing work that the Huntington Society of Canada does uh, for, uh, uh, to support the patients and their families. And uh, um, I would also really like to take this opportunity also to express my gratitude, my profound gratitude for the support that my laboratory, as well as other laboratories across Canada, like mine, uh, receive from the Huntington community. Um, uh, the effort, your effort, and uh, your support uh, do matter, and uh, it makes a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oksana, was there anything you wanted to add? Well, I, I agree completely with Simonetta. I think this is um, a wonderful organization, and I, too, am very grateful for the, the support to, um, to individuals and families affected with HD. Well, Oksana and Simonetta, thank you very much for joining us today. We, uh, this is a new technology for us, to, or a new way of using this, this technology. And I, I'm sure that our community thanks you in being available today, helping sort through the bench to bed side what happens in clinical trials. It's complex. We don't always understand how complex it is, and you've helped us understand that more. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. It's, it's been a wonderful experience, as it was listening to Megan, Megan this morning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks also to everyone joining us today from across Canada. The, uh, this has been a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, Devin has been running around and, and keeping us on track here, so it's, it's a new experience for us, and I hope that we can do this again. You can go to www.hscsymposium.ca to, to get the video of this. You can also go there, and please do go there, to answer a survey and let us know, how did this work for you? Do we, should we do it more like this? Should we do it differently? The reason we can do this is because we get such great feedback and because we have great experts that are willing to come and talk to you. So let us know how this went for you. Let us know if you want us to keep doing this. Have a wonderful day. If you're together in a group with individuals, enjoy the rest of your day. If you're joining us from home, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <coughs>